Psalm 23 um, is where we are this morning. It's the song of the shepherd. Probably, undoubtedly, the most well-known, most quoted, most often preached uh, passage of Scripture at funerals and, and in times of encouragement. And, and uh, to be honest with you, most of us probably only know it as that. We may only know it in, in, in tough times. We may only know it or recite it in parts of it uh, when life is tough or at or after a funeral. But listen, there was never really a, a psalm that is, is so much for life as this one. Okay, Now, to understand Psalm chapter 23, you have to understand Psalm 22 and you have to understand Psalm 24. It's not a standalone. Now, David didn't name these. David only wrote, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 psalms, not all of them. But we know this one was written by him because it says a psalm of David, right? So when he wrote them, they weren't numbered. But looking at chronology, looking at theme and emphasis and, and the name that is given of God in this psalm and, and in 22 and in 24, we know they're there for a reason. So in order to understand even better Psalm 23, let's look at Psalm 22 and Psalm 24. So here it is. Psalm 22, when you look at it, is, is talking about how God is the good shepherd. Now listen, that's the name given to God, if you will, in Psalm 22. It's important for you to know that and to note that. We see him as the good shepherd in Psalm 24. Psalm 22, I mean, Psalm 22 is all about his crucifixion. It's about Christ dying for our sins, paying the price. Okay? In Psalm 22, good shepherd. Psalm 24, we see him as the chief shepherd. He's the king that will one day return. Now, I know I'm going to work through this fast, but I'm going to repeat it and refer back to it so you can hopefully retain it, all right? So here it is. Psalm 22 is all about the acknowledgement of God sending his son to die on the cross. It's all about the crucifixion and the life that he had to live and give in order for you and I to have a life, right? Psalm 24 is about the chief shepherd who will one day return for us. With those bookends, you need to understand now what Psalm 23 is. Psalm 23, the name given to, to God is he is the great shepherd. He is seen as victorious. Now watch. Victorious with us on a daily basis. I think this is why we love Psalm 23 so much. Number one, but we find ourselves in it. Number two, the personal pronouns that are, that are used so much in Psalm 23. We, we, we resonate with when he makes a statement. We're like, yes, that's me, and yes, I need that, and I hope he's that to me. And God, would you be that to me like you were to David? I, I, we can so easily identify with Psalm 23. Why? Because it, it shows God with us on a daily basis. It's a good thing. Listen, a necessary thing to know that there is a God who's not just some cosmic existence, but know who, who there is a God who sent His Son to die on a cross for our sins because He desires a personal relationship. I mean, we need to know that. It's another thing to know that no matter how much trouble we're experiencing in life and no matter how long sometimes the, the walk of faith may be as a Christian... We know that one day that he's going to return and receive us to himself, and that he's a king, that God, you're over all of this, that, that no matter what I see politically, culturally, environmentally, financially, socially, all of that, no, no matter what I witness on the landscape of life, you're still king, you're still on the throne, and you're coming back. And those are great things to know, right? It's, it's, can I say it this way? I said it at the 10 o'clock, and I hope it fits. I don't know. It, this is like the Big Mac of the Psalms. It's like, God, you've got to have the bun, and you've got to have the bun, but there's these two patties like right there in the middle. Literally, that's what God gives us. God gives us, it's a good thing to know this, and it's a good thing to know this, but right there stuck in the middle is Psalm 23. And it's a victorious God that is with us on a daily basis. And it's experiencing that and knowing that. So I'm going to read Psalm 23, 
And then we're going to look at the different language that is used and the shift that takes place in his language. And I want to show you that. I want to do that one, one by asking you to underline a few words, okay? And, and they're simple words, but it, it'll begin to show you how, how his language changes even in the writing. And then we're going to go back and pull out individual words and show you why he uses those words and what that means to us personally. Verse 1, the Lord is my. Underline the word my. Again, I told you they're simple but it's going, to, it's going to help me walk you through the language change. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Now you're about to underline the word he four times. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leaves me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Underline the word you. For you are with me. Underline the word your. Your rod, underline your. Your staff, they, now watch, comfort me. Underline the word you in verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of... Now watch how he ends the same way he started. My and I, my and I. All the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's an important way to put it. Because even though you and I can read it, and we just did, and it reads well. Remember, it's, this is the Hebrew hymn book. And so what we're learning, these, these are songs to be sung. It's kind of like a poem that sounds better when you read it the way it was intended to be read. This sounds better when you sing it, if you can, the way it's supposed to be sung. And so I want to walk you through why he changes the language the way that he does. And I want to show you first, very first, right there, the first thing is, I want you to notice, he is the great shepherd. So your first fill in the blank and our first sort of emphasis on, on language and personal pronouns is he shows us this he. He is the great shepherd. Psalm 23, 1 says this. Now watch. The Lord. Stop. He stops right there. Let, well, let, rather, let me stop right there. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. Now in most versions, you may notice it, it doesn't always have to be, but most often in the Old Testament, when you see the word Lord written, it's written like it's a smaller font. Like the other font around it is like, say, say size 12, and this is like a type font, like a 10. But it's all caps. It may not be bold, but it's all caps. It doesn't necessarily have to appear that way in your text, but this is the way it's written. Now, this word Lord, the reason why he says that, now, when he says it to us, you and I just hear Lord. When they read it, the Hebrews are reading this, they hear the name Jehovah. Now, God has been called Elohim, Yahweh, Adonai. He's been called a lot of names in the Old Testament. But until now, this is the first time that he's been called Jehovah with seven compound names of God that follows. It's the only text in the entire Bible where seven compound names of God follow his name. And it's, it's contained in one text. So when he introduces us as the Lord... Now, listen, you got to get this. You have to get this statement because it really helps you understand what I'm about to give you. It literally means this. He knows my name and I know his name. He knows my name. So I'm not just calling on, on, remember, this God who sent his son, right? I know there's a God who put things in motion. He sent a son to die on a cross. And I'm not just banking on, hoping that this God will one day return. Is that true? Will he return? When will he? I don't know. He's a king. It's totally different to say the Lord and you make it extremely personal. It's not just a God of cosmic existence. It not, it's not just a God of awesome power. It's a very personal God who wants a personal relationship with you. And he says, the Lord, this Lord Jehovah is mine. He knows my name and I know his. So here's what I hope you get from it. I hope you get this morning, not the existence of God. Not that God is some king and he's ruling and he may come back one day. But I'm hoping that you have a personal experience with God as the psalmist intended because this is what his language shows us. The Lord is my shepherd. I want to walk you through this, this name Jehovah that was revealed. So when you look at the Hebrew, it's, what we've done is you can actually, what they've done is you can extract the name Jehovah from three other sort of Hebrew words put together in one. And so it's Jehovah, Jehovah, okay? This ov and ah and yet je have different meanings. Yet means he will be. Ov means is being. Ah means he was. Now to you and I, we just see, we hear the word Lord. But remember, he's writing to mostly Hebrews that are reading this. 
So if you recall the story of Moses and God calling Moses to lead the children of Israel out, and God tells Moses to go and tell Pharaoh, and Pharaoh, I mean, Moses says, well, who am I to say who sent me? God gives a really, an- really good answer. Just tell him I am. Right? Now, me not being Moses, I'm going, that's probably not enough. Right? I'm going, I am? Really? You want me to say that? But there was so much in that name. You see, when you and I talk about God, we really can't get grammatically our, our tenses very well. It's, it's almost like God always is, is, was, is being, was. It's because what does that mean? When you say Jehovah, now this is how he starts out. The Lord. Who? Jehovah. Jehovah, I am will be, is being, always was. He is the, he's, God says of himself in the book of Hebrews, I am the same God today, yesterday, and forever. He's literally repeating who he is. So he's not just saying some God of, of cosmic existence, some God of cataclysmic power and control. He's saying this is a very personal God who will be, is being, was all of that I need in my life. This Lord, Jehovah, and then he literally rattles off seven or, or more compound names of this God. Hang on. He's not just saying there's this God in existence somewhere. Remember? He is the great shepherd here who is victoriously with us on a daily basis. Let me rattle them off. And I will, I'm will. i going to go through these fast. I apologize. Um, you're, they're, not, they're only going to be on the screen. Uh, you can take pictures with your phone or go back on, on our, our app and, and, and stop and, and so forth and get these notes. But I have to rattle these off for you real fast. One, because of time. And it's just a whole other sermon in itself. Okay. So when he fer- refers to the Lord as Jehovah, in verse 1 he says, Jehovah Rohai. Literally means the Lord is my shepherd. And then he says, I shall not want That is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. The Lord is my shepherd, Jehovah is my shepherd, Jehovah is my provider. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is my peace. Jehovah Rahai, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shalom. Continuing on down through the psalm, he says the Lord is my healer, Jehovah Rafi. The Lord is my healer, Jehovah Sakaidnu. The Lord is my righteousness. You'll lead me in the paths of righteousness. Jehovah Shema. The Lord is there. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of of death, you are with me. Jehovah Nissi. The Lord our banner. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Meaning no matter where I am in the battle, no matter what life does to me, whether it's job or emotions or, or health or just co-workers or what no, no matter what life is doing to me at that moment whether I'm flat on my face flat on my back I'm down on my knees I'm standing crying and begging for help I'm, I'm actually standing looking for help and hope no matter where I find myself in the struggles of life God says I'm going to be an ever consistent banner that you can see me no matter where you are you can find me in the battlefield of life Jehovah Nissi God is my banner Jehovah M. Kadesh if you will, the, the Lord is um, my sanctifier. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. In other words, God, I don't know that I can live this thing called the Christian life. I just don't feel like I have what it takes to complete it. You don't. Remember, the Christian life is not only difficult, it's impossible to live without Christ. And God, you are the one that is making me more like you. I am not making myself more like you. You are making me more like you. Jehovah Nissi, the banner. Jehovah M. Kadesh, the Lord, my sanctifier. Jehovah El Elyon, the Lord most high. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There's something that more to me to worship than just me or what I'm seeing or what I can only feel or entertain on my own. That God, you are lifted up, you are exalted above all. So listen, when David starts out, the Lord is my shepherd. And then he rattles off all these other compound names of that Jehovah God that he just introduced to us. The God who will be, is being, and always was. He now lists off all these components. Listen, for every day of the week, you have a different experience with that God. For every emotion, for every situation, 
for all that you're going through. You have a revealed characteristic side of that God. It's not just, well, God, I know you're like Father Time and you're up there and you've set things in motion and, and you don't have any interference with man. But for once, could you just consider listening to me? No. And God, I know you're this king, and I'm not sure that I have what it takes to approach you. And again, things are sort of set in motion, and I hope when I die that I'll meet you. No. And number one, I know there is a God who sent a son who wants to have a personal relationship with me. And as I live this life, I know that one day he will return for me. But it's not just, you know, God died and sent his son to die on the cross and good luck and hope you make it till I return. No, it's I am this extremely personal God that you can know my name and I can know your name. And you can know me by experience in all of these needs as a shepherd, as a provider, as peace, as healer, as righteousness, as presence, as a banner, as sanctifier as the most high, the one and only thing worthy to worship in your life. He is the great shepherd. And all of that is in the Lord is my shepherd. Isn't that a, we're only in verse 1. How long do you guys have? I don't have anywhere else to go. His personal relationship is what he's expressing in Psalm 23, verses 2 and 3. Listen, this is where we had you underline the word he four times. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still water. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Let's walk through that. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. Watch, I shall not want. Now, that, that, that doesn't mean that He doesn't have unanswered prayers. That doesn't mean that all of the explanations He's received for His circumstances. That doesn't mean that He has no more desires. Listen, hang on. What that's saying is, because this is who Jehovah is, right? All of those attributes I just listed. Because this is who Jehovah is, I have learned that in Him is everything I need. Did you get that? So often we make our relationship with God about what He's giving us or what He's not giving us. We often treat God like a heavenly waiter, Correct? God, I, can, you give me, can you bring me some tea with that ice water? And Lord, I've kind of been here for 25 minutes and the meal's not here, right? With, Lord, I've been praying on this thing for two or three years. God, I'm just not here. If we're not careful, we can make our relationship with God and treat Him like a heavenly waiter. We only make it about what He's doing for us. But what, the David, what David is trying to say in the Psalms is, because He is my Jehovah, when I find myself in Him, that's all I really need. You and I need to learn how to have a Christian life that is extremely content on just being with who he is regardless of what he's doing for us right now. It ought to be just enough to be in his presence because when I'm in his presence, I know that he is my shepherd, provider, peace, healer, righteousness, presence, banner, sanctifier, my most high. This is what he's trying to say. The Lord is my shepherd. I find myself in him and because of that, I don't want He's everything to me. I may not have everything answered. I may not have all things explained. But this I know. His presence is enough because he's the great shepherd. He says he makes me lie down in green pastures. I have to apologize here. It's not just to you but to me. But I can honestly remember the first time I preached um, Psalm 23. And I mentioned what I'm about to mention to you. I literally got, and this was the day before emails. I actually got a handwritten letter that said, how dare you call me dumb? I literally, so I'm just telling you right now, don't send me any letters. It's not me. This is the Bible. Sheep aren't actually the brightest animals in the kingdom. Sheep are actually pretty dumb. As a matter of fact, when, it's, when the Bible says he makes me lie down in green pastures, sheep will eat right through the grass down to the dirt. They'll keep eating dirt. That's one of the, they need a shepherd that moves them on to greener pastures. Ezekiel chapter 37 is a great read on that of how God our shepherd takes us from pasture to pasture and higher to higher. It's sort of like this glory to glory and stage to stage in relationship with him. But when the Bible says he makes me lie down in green pastures, what it's saying is, is you and I, like sheep, need a shepherd that lead us. Stop. I, let me use myself as an illustration. I couldn't remember when I was first called into ministry. One of, some of the best advice I ever received was this. An older pastor told me, he said, always live in the presence of God and never learn to live off experience. He said, because the longer you're in ministry, the more you'll be tempted to live off experience rather than current presence of God. And now having been in ministry long enough, I know that to be true. That I can sort of put things into co-pilot, right? The same is true of your Christian life. 
you and I can get so used to just coming to church and singing the songs and reading the Bible when I need to that we sort of live off of co-pilot rather than letting God continually pilot our life into His presence. So what is He saying here? There's going to be times that I'm going to have to make you, put you in green pastures. I'm going to have to ask you to step out in faith and go on a missions trip. I'm going to ask you to serve me, share your faith with somebody else, attend church, read the Bible. In other words, don't live off of somebody else's faith. Don't live off of last week's faith or last year's faith. Live off what God is doing in your life right now. For him to lead us to green pastures, listen, means he's going to lead us where we can be fed. That's what it means. He's going to put us in experiences where we can be fed and we can grow in him. Which is why I've said it's entirely possible. It's entirely possible for you to grow old in church but never grow up in church. You can attend church all your life but never really grow up. That's part of what I do now is deal with churches that, that have stayed where they are. And you and I can be the same. We can do the same thing. We can just be content to stay where we are in our faith rather than grow up. Listen to the Bible. The Bible tells us he makes me lie down by green pastures. He will lead you where you can be fed. He also says he'll lead us by still waters. Did you know that sheep don't drink from a running stream? They only drink by still water. You and I are the same way. right? You, you, you know this. and I'm going to say this a lot. You know this. You can come in here on Sunday morning and the worship is awesome. I, I love that last song we came into. I mean, I came into the very back of it and I was just back there doing Jesus aerobics. I mean, I don't know about, maybe I'm glad you didn't see me, but I was like, yes, I love this song. You and I can come into worship and we can have a great worship. It can be a great message and great coffee and great friendship. But you know, 45 minutes from now when you leave this and you go to Cracker Barrel and your meal's not here, you've already lost your religion by the time you get there, right? You're like, I was, I was like, mercy is falling. And you're, your hands are up, you're singing it. But you're like, where is my food? I've been here forever, right? I mean, 45 minutes after you sing mercy is falling, you can be like, there ain't no mercy with me. Get my food now, right? He leaves me beside still waters. You know, Monday morning you'll hit I-4. Tuesday you'll hit a doctor's appointment. Wednesday, co-worker, job situation, stress in relationships. Here's what he's saying. With all the anxiety that's going on in life, I'm not asking you to drink from a busy running stream. When everything is happening around you, I'll lead you by still waters. That in my presence, even though everything around you is chaotic and crazy, you will be calm and still. Isn't that the amazing benefit of being led by the great shepherd? He makes me lie down. He leads me by still waters. Now let's look at these three statements together. And then I want to break them down and go back and explain them. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Let's deal with those. So coming off of what we just spoke about, still waters, the Bible says, the psalmist says that he, he restores my soul. The literal reading of that is this. He brings my soul back. Okay, for just a moment, it's not on the screen, so I need you to be visual with me. Imagine a bullseye, an outer ring, an inner ring, and the bullseye itself. Can you, do you have that image? I've explained this before, but it's been a while. The Christian life is explained by Paul as that, that the outer ring is the flesh that we see, right? The inner ring, the middle part of our life, is called the soul. The soul is referred to as your mind, your will, and your emotions, most of us live out of that on a daily basis. We think with our mind. We, do, we push ourselves through with our will, right? And we sort of move in, in and around and respond to based upon our emotions. Now, when God created you, Adam and Eve, when God created Adam and Eve, the Bible says he breathed life into them. It didn't say he breathed air. The life that he breathed into them was his spirit. So at the very core of who you are, where God inhabited man at first creation was at your spirit. When God, the life that he gave you was life through his spirit. It wasn't air that went through your lungs that gave you life. It was his spirit that gave the air life in your lungs. Sin interrupted that picture because we chose to choose something other than be obedient to God. Sin came in a free will and kicked God out, right? So now every, everybody that's born is born with an empty hole. 
which is why we try to put anything and everything within that until we come to the realization that it's Christ we need back in our life. That's why God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to restore us to our original position of being with and in Him. Make sense? Now, what happens is this. When He says, He restores my soul, just like that restaurant illustration. Life, life does what it does, and, and, and we all of a sudden begin to live by our soul. We try to willpower and push it through. Well, we try to, with our mind, overcome things. We try with our heart to navigate. And when he says, he brings back my soul, quickly my soul gets me out of sorts, right? Have you been, am I the only one that if something gets in my mind, it affects my heart? Or if something gets in my heart, it affects my mind? Or both, right? And then it affects my emotions, and before I know it, my heart, and my, uh, my heart and my head now tell my emotions or my emotions override logic in my mind, right? He says, uh, what, he, what, uh, what the good shepherd does is he restores my... How does he do that? By being spirit-led. When I once again realize the Jehovah God that he is, and I get God back in here, instead of every once in a while having God leak out, like, God, I need you to answer a prayer. I need you to pay a bill. I need you to give me direction. Instead of God just leaking out when we need him, God just literally comes out and takes over the whole thing. And that's what it means to be a spirit-led Christian. So when he says he restores my soul, he comes back in and restores order to what was chaos, which is why it's important for him to lead us to where we can be fed by still waters so we can focus on him so that the soul is put back together. Make sense? This is what he's saying. The Lord is my shepherd. He's not just a God who sent a son. He's not just a God who's coming back. He is a God that is personally interested and invested in who we are. The Bible says he restores my soul, but he leads me in the paths of righteousness. Watch this. For his namesake. Now, there's a reason why I had you understand Psalm 23 in light of Psalm 22 and Psalm 24. Because there were three names assigned to God. Psalm 22, he was the good shepherd. Psalm 23, he's the great shepherd. Psalm 24, he's the chief shepherd. So when the Bible says, he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Listen, it literally means God's character, God's reputation is at stake, not yours. Most often we make the Christian life about us. Will I be a good Christian? Will I be able to do it? No, you won't. You will never be able to do it apart from God. And listen, when, when he says, for his name's sake, what name? A good shepherd, a great shepherd, and a chief shepherd. Listen, when you and I live out, when his righteousness is in us, it is his character that comes out of us, and it is his character that people see in us when life is chaotic, when life isn't what it needs to be, when my soul was out of order and it now gets put back in order. It is the very character of God that is now seen coming out of us, and it is that which people need to see in order to turn their eyes to Christ. Christ and to God. It is not your testimony of how you handle it. It is what comes out of you. Who comes out of you? The good shepherd, the great shepherd, the chief shepherd. It is his namesake that becomes your testimony. It's not your living. It's his living in you that comes out of you. That is what makes your life incredible, lived out testimony before God. When he says it is his namesake, he's not saying, oh, Ron, if you were better, I could do more. Oh, Ron, if you could just put things together, I could help you out. No. He's like, you can't. I'm coming in so I can come out so I can let everybody else know who it is that's helping you out. Does that make sense? Man, that ought to preach. Somebody should have stood up and run around the building by now. I'm just kidding. Maybe not. For his name's sake. What name? Good shepherd, great shepherd, chief shepherd. Let's go back to the word path so we understand it even more. The word paths there. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. The word paths means circular or orbit. Hang on. Let me give you some insight into that. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible is Acts chapter 17, verse 28. It says, in him, circular orbit, in him we live and move and have our being. <laughs> when I have God here, when I get God right, I get everything else right. And God leads me, when I'm in Him, wherever He leads me, I don't mind going. Isn't that amazing? So when it says, He leads me in circular orbit paths of righteousness for His name's sake, in Him we live and move and have our being. He switches His language from, from He is the great shepherd. Now watch. So He says, You and you alone are the great shepherd. You and you alone. Why is this important? Watch. He is no longer talking about 
the shepherd. He is, he is, he is. He's talking to the shepherd. He's no longer just talking about him. He's talking to him. That is a huge shift in language. Now I'm going to give you a little insight into how we do worship at Waterstone. I've shared this with you before, but just to remind you of it. So what we do here, we pray is, is, is number one, spirit-led. Number two, it's very intentional. And number three, biblical and whatever order you want. We pray all three of those elements happen on Sunday morning. So we don't just pick out songs just because we haven't sung them in a while. Or they sound good. But our worship is extremely intentional. And it follows that, that bullseye diagram. Because our flow of worship is we want, to, we want to start out here with you with God. To bring you here to God. Then to send you back out. That's our worship experience. So for instance, you can choose 9, 10, or 11. You can choose 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. here at 10 o'clock at Lake Mary. And on any, any given Sunday, you may not be sitting around the same people. I mean, there's a few over here that sort of sit in the same spot every time. When you kind of mess me up when you move, I'm like, where'd you go? Right? And thankfully, we're not that traditional church with the pews, with the dedicated plaques of great aunt so-and-so who stepped off the Mayflower and only that family can sit there. Thankfully, we're not that. My point is, is that you never know who you're going to be sitting around. Well, when you come into worship... If you don't know who you're sitting around, especially if you're new to us, you may not feel like right off the bat just lifting up your hands. Right? You're like, I don't know these people. What are they going to think about me? Do they do this? So we start out by singing songs that talk about God. With the hopes by the time we get to that last song right before the message and the message are talking to God. And we hope to end the message where now you talk to God and God talks to you, which is called the invitation. And then you respond to God and then go out and talk about God. That's our worship. This is what David is saying. This is exactly how David is is expressing this. He starts out with he. This is who he is. But then he goes, "Let let me talk to you. You and you alone are the great shepherd. And he rattles off a number of things that God provides. He says, you, God, provide. Let me give them to you. He goes, you, God, provide. Number one, peace. Peace. Number one, you provide peace in my life. He continues with, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. He gives us peace. Listen to the Bible and backing this up. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7. Hang on, watch. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your and your... We just talked about that. And the peace of God guards your soul. Your heart and your mind. When the peace of God is there, the peace of God leaks out and overwhelms and and overruns and takes over your heart and your mind, right? If I'm thinking something in my heart, most often it affects my mind. If I can't get it out of my mind, it's going to affect my heart. The peace of God steps in and takes over that. And he says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, sometimes our thoughts can take us so far down. Sometimes our heart can take us so far down and so far away. That we wonder, God, can you even reach me there, right? Now, here's the interesting thing about a shadow. A shadow needs two things. A shadow needs light, and a shadow needs substance. A shadow needs a source of light, and it needs substance, something to shine on and off, right? Even in that scenario, there is the light of God. There's only one light. There's only one true light. There is the light of God shining off the substance of whatever is bothering you, reaching through that, and it's only a shadow reminding you He's still there. Even in the deepest valley of where you are, of wherever your mind takes you, of wherever your heart takes you, the light of God is still reaching you. And this is why it's called peace. Because my mind and my heart can take me to a valley. My mind and my heart can overrun my spirit And it can sort of govern my soul and take me away in my fellowship and make me feel like God is so distant. But even in that, the peace of God comes in and through the light of God only bounces off of what's around me and reminds me that He's in charge. John chapter 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you. I like that. My peace I give to you. He didn't give us a peace or some form of peace. He gave us His peace. And I love it that He adds this. Not as the world gives do I give to you. So therefore, let, your, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. I love that. You see, the, the world is searching for some form of peace. Everybody is, right? 
You hear in all times of all types of versions, right? Go, go buy a jasmine candle and sit down crisscross applesauce and contemplate the lint in your navel kind of a thing and clear your mind and, and clear your body and, and, and think only good thoughts and focus on Mother Earth and hold this crystal and cleanse your... Everybody's searching. He goes, I'm not giving you peace like the world's giving you. You don't have to light a candle. You don't have to hold on to a rock. You don't have to clear your mind. You just need to be in me. Peace I leave with you. God it designed and intentioned you and I to have his peace and to live in peace. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Number two, he leaves us his presence, for you are with me. Presence. Listen to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, say it with me, I will... Now, this is written in Greek. If you look at the Greek, the Greek is far more emphatic. And the Greek, when, when he uses the word never, he uses it a number of times in the Greek. It's, it's, it's nearly like reading, I will never, never, no, not, never, no, never, not leave you nor forsake you. He's being over emphatic, like, listen to me. He knows that one of our fears is, is being left alone and, and being insecure without him. So he's given us the security and the surety of his presence. Number three, he gives us his protection. Your rod and your staff... Now listen, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now don't call up my dad and send him to get in trouble. But when I was a kid, my dad used a leather belt to correct me. I never once wrote a song that said, and your leather belt comforts me. <laughs> now the staff and the rod were used for both protection and correction. So if a sheep was wandering off and following the dirt trail instead of the grass trail he would take that staff and hook it around his neck and bring him back. But at the same time, the staff was used to fend off predators. The rod, the same way. Sometimes it, it sounds horrible, but if a sheep just did not learn, a shepherd would often break the sheep's leg, hold the sheep over them, which is why you see them carrying like this, hold the sheep over them, and shepherds will tell you this, to keep the sheep, number one, so they could carry it, number two, close to its heartbeat, so that the sheep would learn to stay close to the shepherd. But that rod was also used to fend off and get rid of brush and briars and debris and predators. It was both to protect and to correct. It was both to, to guide and, and to govern. For you are with me, your, your rod and your shield, they comfort me. He also gives us rest. I love this. He, the Bible says that you prepare a table. Now stop and think about it. Now you understand I'm, 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 I'm going through these really fast. Almost each one of these is its own message. For instance, I could spend an entire message on what it means to prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. I don't know about you, but when I know enemies are around, I'm not sitting down. And I'm certainly not going to sit down at the table, right? If I know enemies are around, I mean, I'm doing whatever I got to do. Hide, my, hide or arm myself or move things around. I'm not sitting down. But not only that, he, he, he didn't just say, put up a table. He said, I'm setting a table. To set a table doesn't mean just a table and chairs or benches. It means to set the table, right? The placemat, the, the plates, the chargers, whatever you're going to put on it, the utensils, the, the candles, whatever. He just told us what he set the table with. The Lord is my shepherd, provider, peace, healer, righteousness, presence, banner, sanctifier. He is the most high. He set the table with his presence. In the middle of your enemies, in the middle of attack, you get to sit down with a table set by God, which is the presence, His presence Himself. That's how you and I can sit in the middle of an attack because of what was set before us. What does He put before us? God sets a table, a table of grace, for us to rest and replenish, a table to sit this is why the psalmist says later on, Be still and know that I am God. What are you to know? Jehovah, Rahai, Jireh, Shalom, Rafi, Zekaidnu, Shema, Nisi, Kadesh, El Elyon. And know that I am that God and know my character. Number three and number four, he gives us his remedies. He gives us his remedies. He says, I, You will anoint my head with oil. So many messages in this one. But when a sheep was anointed with oil, 
um, what it meant for them was obviously protection in so many ways. It's, it's a balm that heals if there's cuts or wounds. Obviously, sheep may go in and out of briars or, or, or thickets uh, or twigs, and the oil would have caused the briars and the thickets to not stick in the head as they were eating. Um, it was obviously as, as an aroma around them. So many uses for oil. For you and I, it literally means what it means to them, that, that we are anointed to show that we are chosen, that we are blessed, that we are redeemed, that we are adopted, that we are forgiven. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. All the promises of God find their yes. Some versions say, and the promises of God find their amen in Him. Meaning when God comes in and anoints us and demonstrates to us that He is the good shepherd, the great shepherd, and the chief shepherd, that He is our shepherd, provider, healer, sanctifier, righteousness, presence, our most high. When He steps in and is that to us, it takes care of everything that ails us or wants to separate us from Him which cannot. Also the Bible says and the psalmist writes that He provides our rejoicing. He provides our rejoicing. He says it this way, my cup runs over. Now you may know this, but this is a cultural statement that's being made here that maybe you and I don't do. Maybe we do it other ways, but when the Bible says my cup runs over, whenever you invited a guest over to your house, if it was time for them to leave, you only filled their cup halfway. You know, you've had folks over, right? Life group, and they're just staying a long time, and so you're like, okay... And so you start cleaning and putting the dishes away, hoping they're kind of getting the message like, um, got to go to bed. Instead of just saying, get out, get out, get out, right? Whatever you do, clean dishes, whatever. This is a very nice way of saying, how'd you come in? How can I help you out, right? <laughs> kind of a thing. If the cup was continued to be filled to the full, it meant stay as long as you want. For the cup to be overflowing, he's making a statement that says, never leave. This is one of those verses where I've mentioned that says, that talks about there are more times in the Bible mentioned where God wants to spend time with you than you want to spend time with God. So for God to overflow our cup, it meant so much more than abundance. And it meant so much more than he's making a mess. It means never leave. I want to forever be in your presence and I want you to forever be with me. This is an overwhelming, emphatic statement of security. Security of your salvation. That if God is saying, I never want you to leave me, you cannot lose your salvation the moment you put your faith and trust in Christ. You didn't do anything to put yourself into the Father's hands, and nothing can pluck you out of the Father's hands. It's a statement of security. So let's finish where, where he finishes. He says, to me. Did you notice the language change? He starts out with he, then he says to you, now he says to me. He, to you, back to me. He says, to me, you are the great shepherd. And he gives us two things. He says, to me, I am given two things. Number one, I am given help for today. I am given help for today. Here's how he says it. He says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I love what one commentator said, one old preacher said. Uh, I don't remember who it was, but it said, he said he gives us goodness for the steps and mercy for the stumbles. Don't we need that? God, I want to trust you. Help me. Goodness for the steps. When we step the wrong way or make a mistake, mercy for the stumbles. Like two little dogs nipping at your heels, following you wherever you walk. He says, I am given today help for today. Number two, in closing, he says, I'm giving you hope for tomorrow. He goes, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, here's the good thing. You and I, at least me, when we come to church on Sunday in the worship and the message and the fellowship, and then we go home and we, we open up our, our playlist and, and we, the songs that speak to us, or we, we get in the car at any moment, we hit the radio and that song, whatever that worship, God answers your prayer, God speaks through somebody sharing their word with you, all of a sudden you, you know you're in that. You see, here's the good thing that God does. Again, God doesn't look at us and say, I sent my son, he died on the cross, he's back up here with heaven. Good luck. Hope you make it till the end. That's not what he says. He literally says, and I love the way it's worded here, grace here, glory there. 
In him we live and move and have our being. In him we have everything we'll ever need. This the Lord is my shepherd. This Jehovah who is all of that is everything I'll ever need. That's why it's the song of the shepherd. Did you know Jesus gave three invitations his entire ministry? Jesus gave three simple invitations. Come see. Come dine. Go and tell. Did you know you can see all three of those invitations in the psalm? From he to you to me. He says, he, this is what I see in you. To me, you are this. Come and dine. And to me, I'm going to go back out and tell because surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Where are you in this psalm? Where are you in these invitations? Are you just to the point where you're, you're coming and seeing, checking it out? Is there this God? What's it about? Not really sure if I'm ready to commit. Not really sure if I'm ready to dive right in. Have you had an experience where you're no longer curious about Him? You're sitting down at the table with Him. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door and lets me in, behold, I will come in and have fellowship with Him. Are, are, you, not just, are, you, are you no longer just showing up, but are you... Having fellowship with God? Have you made the decision not just to check Him out, but to trust Him? And with that, have you moved from showing up to fellowship to sharing? Where are you in Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd. Is He? Come and see. Come and dine. Go and tell.